Well, friends, it's that time of year again. A time of joy. A time for spending with friends and family, exchanging presents, drinking a little too much. A time for love and happiness. A time of cold. A time of lengthening shadow. Of a claustrophobic gloom that clings to every corner, even as the pale sun illuminates your room. The skeletal fingers of once vibrant trees scratching at your window pane. A wind whimpering about the house. Please, please let me in. A time of death. A time of renewal through sacrifice. A time when gods and monsters once walked this land. Not the gods you know. The ones to whom we offer platitudes hollow. The old gods. Kram Kruk. Don. Morrigan. Their appetites are only sated through blood this eventide. Blood to rouse the spring, that it may return its days of rustling shade. And just over the horizon, a great machine of death is roaring and rearing. We can hear it always. Earthquake. Starvation. The ever-renewing sun of corpse flesh. It's Christmas! Just bleed, gang. We did it. We survived another year. Without exaggeration, and in all seriousness, in this day and age, simply making it to the finish line of another 365 days is truly something to be cherished and celebrated. And if you're here watching this, I'm glad you're with us. So without further ado, welcome to the second annual Review of the Year and Blowy Awards. A thorough retelling of the top, bottom, and switch stories in the world of MMA. But first, a tribute to those that we lost in 2023. Turning into the beast. That's right. Channel 81 on your FM dial. And I want you just to take your head and turn the volume real, real loud. I don't want to have to beat you up. One, two, three. With bloodshot eyes and fear-laden hearts, 
we awoke to the pain of a new year. 2023 was still in its crib, barely a day old, when we were hit with one of the biggest news stories of the year. But we weren't the only ones being hit, when Dana White decided to do some guerrilla marketing for Power Slap. At a Cabo nightclub on New Year's Eve, Dana had done the one thing that he himself said you don't bounce back from. Dana, however, appears to be the Lazarus of wife slapping, as it's almost 2024 and he's suffered all the consequences of running a red light in a Grand Theft Auto game. Tyron Woodley, not content with losing twice to a former Disney kid and squandering the remains of his already tattered reputation, was scheduled to fight yet another INTERNET PERSONALITY KSI. After the fight fell through, Tyron claimed he had never been so disrespected in his life, proving that he still hasn't read the comments on any of his music videos. All things considered, it was a rough month for KSI as a bout with professional douchebag Dylan Dennis also fell through, and in the MMA community there was much wailing and lamenting and gnashing of teeth at the prospect of losing such a hotly anticipated fight. After ghosting KSI, Dennis tried to make inroads back to MMA by telling Bellator boss Scott Coker that he was interested in a fight, much in the same way that I'm interested in reading all 140 volumes of Baki. I'm interested, but I'm also quite confident that it's never going to happen. In some rather unfortunate timing for Dana, one day after his slap fighting home movie leaked, an expo for Power Slap took place where Power Slap athletes, or slapletes for short, discussed what it takes to become a real ultimate slapper. And I, I literally don't, I don't do any type of training. Like, I'm my kids, man. And uh, we figured it out. It's headbanging, dude. I go to a lot of concerts and I headbang all the time. Um, as far as the slapping is concerned, you know, uh, hey, I look in the mirror sometimes and I'll just give myself a good whack. Sometimes I'll just put my hands down and let them go at it. You know, hit me a good few times, you know, get that brain rattled a little bit and just uh, feel that pressure. The reaction to Power Slap's first episode was greeted with the kind of abject horror normally reserved for the discovery of a mass grave. Opinions ranged from dumb as fuck to sickening, to Brendan Schaub himself describing it as the dumbest shit I've ever seen. Strong words, considering this man looks in a mirror each day. Dicey, dicey! In other joke news, Jake Paul announced that he was signing with the PFL, with his ultimate goal being to compete in MMA. I've already disrupted boxing, and now it's time to disrupt MMA. And by disrupt, he means make it objectively worse for all involved. Thankfully for us, it's almost a year since this announcement, and Jake is still about as close to competing in professional MMA as I am. Hashtag, who's ready for camp, huh? Jake's announcement, however, was kind of a case of the worst person you know making a really good point, as he claimed to be fighting for increased fighter pay for all PFL athletes. Our fighters will be receiving 50% of the revenue, yes. You heard that correctly. A true 50-50 partnership with fighters that still allows them to be individuals and even monetize their own sponsorship deals, which, as we know, isn't allowed in the UFC. Alleged MMA fighter Mike Jackson was released from the UFC after a career that could charitably be described as the Brooklyn Brawler of the Reebok era. Both of Jackson's fans were said to be devastated by this news, but it does at least open up the possibility for Dana to make the grudge match of this century, CM Punk vs Mike Jackson, in Power Slap. Dana, make it happen before Street Beefs does. The ugliest breakup since Anderson's shin met Chris Weidman rolled on into January 2023. Conor McGregor and Artem Lobov, former BFFs and two halves of power couple McLobov, found themselves in court again. Lobov was forced to cash in all those Reebok tokens he earned fighting for the UFC when a judge ordered him to pay for McGregor's legal fees after Lobov failed to secure a Twitter injunction against McGregor. And I think I speak for all of us when I say that this was genuinely tragic news, as anything that keeps McGregor from social media is unquestionably a cause we should all support. 
In the first tremor of what would prove to be a seismic issue for the UFC, Dana White revealed that UFC heavyweight champion Francis Ngannou was no longer UFC heavyweight champion Francis Ngannou. After Francis refused to fight for Venom coupons and the change Dana found behind the UFC's couch, Dana told Francis to get the fuck out of his office and company and go have a celebrity boxing match with Mr. Beast or whatever the fuck. I think Francis is in a place right now where he wants, he doesn't want to take a lot of risk. Feels like he's in a good position um, where he could fight lesser opponents and, and make more money. So we're going we're gonna to let him do that. Speculation was rife among internet fight experts. Would Francis ever get another payday like Uncle Dana was offering? Was he a big enough name to command that kind of money? Shouldn't he just have been content with the Venom coupons? Had he fumbled the bag? You know, he's got it in his head that there's, there's bigger opportunities outside the UFC with, um, you know, lesser opponents. Foreshadowing is a narrative device in which suggestions or warnings about events to come are dropped or planted. Jamal Hill won the vacant light heavyweight title at UFC 283 after putting on a clinic against Glover Teixeira. Teixeira, a legend of the sport who had previously been the oldest man to ever become a champion at age 42, was forced to retire in the middle of an empty arena. The event was held in Brazil, and after the co-main event which saw Mexican Brandon Moreno defeat Brazilian Davison Figueiredo, fans hurled trash at Moreno and left the arena. The vast majority of the crowd had fucked off before the main event had even started, meaning the only things left in the arena after the event were to share his gloves. But Glover wasn't the only legend to retire in the saddest way imaginable that month. Shogun Hua, one time voted by this channel as the sexiest man to ever soccer kick people into unconsciousness. Youngest ever Pride Grand Prix winner, former heir apparent to Vanderlei Silva's throne of violence, and former UFC light heavyweight champion fought his last fight. At 41, Shogun had been dodging retirement almost as hard as Queen Elizabeth, but time comes for us all, and mixed martial arts is no country for old men. At UFC 283, Shogun proved the old adage to be true, that you either retire a hero, or live long enough to see yourself get knocked the fuck out by some kid who then proceeds to do a fortnight dance over your still twitching corpse. And January ended with the announcement that flyweight queen, my Skathak, my Boudicca, my eternal Valkyrie, Valentina Shevchenko, was... was... was, not a dream. was booked to fight... Why? Why can't I remember? Hi, Mom. My life is a living hell. Oh, fuck, my head hurts. It's not a dream. Two thousand and twenty-three proved to be a bad year for anyone considered to be a legend of the sport. From Shogun Hua having his opponent perform a meme dance over his grave, to Teixeira retiring in an arena emptier than Brendan Schaub's skull. And in February, another fighter worthy of being placed on MMA's Mount Crushmore made the walk for the last time. Fedor Emelianenko, Pride FC legend, knockout impresario, accordion wizard and man whose mother I have a crush on finally called it quits after a career stretching back to the early 2000s. In his last fight, Fedor faced Ryan Bader, one of the most boring fighters since Rise of the Robots. Bader chose Fedor's retirement fight to finally do something other than hump legs and dutifully send a 47-year-old Fedor on the lightless walk. Dana White, never a man to miss an opportunity or the side of his wife's face, took this moment to declare that Fedor, a man who holds wins over Crow Cop, Big Nog, Mark Coleman, Mark Hunt, Kevin Randleman, and has one of the longest winning streaks in heavyweight history, had never been that good. 
and while he may never have been up to the lofty standards of famous cardio kickboxing instructor Dana, at least all of his victories are over the same gender. In other spousal abuser news, Greg Hardy had a few childhood memories permanently erased at Bare Knuckle FC's hilariously titled Knuckle Mania event. Former football player and current piece of shit Hardy was finished by Josh Watson and literally no one was sad to see it. At UFC 284, Alexander Volkanovsky got a permission slip from his mother to take a field trip up to lightweight to face Islam Makachev. Makachev proved that having a surname that ends in V is the best base for MMA when he humped out a unanimous decision win over a man widely considered to be much smaller than himself. In unsurprising power slap news, Professional slapper and power slap season one contestant John Kennedy was suspended from competition after testing positive for cocaine. And realistically, it makes perfect sense that in a sport as comprehensively moronic as power slap, blasting a few rails before the fight is considered a performance enhancer. February was not a good time for power slap, as the show was still struggling with its biggest viral moment being held in a Cabo nightclub its competitors being suspended for party drugs, and culminated with US Congressman Bill Pascrell Jr. sending a letter to TBS and Warner Brothers demanding they explain why in the name of Slap Jesus they were airing this relentless trash. And in some late-breaking power slap news, while googling for a picture of Slap Jesus for this bit, I discovered that Slap Jesus himself was dropped by power slap after he was jailed for multiple crimes, including burglary and domestic violence. So Power Slap is going great. At Kazakh MMA promotion Octagon League, fighter Tamer Zaparov had the most ill-advised post-fight celebration since Hamzat screamed Allahu Akbar gonna kill everyone on September 11th. But the biggest combat sports news of February wasn't in the UFC, MMA, or even a Cabo nightclub, as Jake Paul finally fought someone who wasn't old enough to be his dad, but not young enough to be kissed by his dad, and wasn't more washed than or Kelly's sheets. This was the first time Jake had actually boxed someone who trained exclusively in boxing, and over eight rounds, the entire MMA sphere lived vicariously through Tommy Fury as he did what most rational human beings want to do, and put an ass whooping on Jake Paul. Post fight, Paul immediately announced his intention to go back to exclusively picking opponents old enough to have owned a Commodore 64. Let's you play hundreds more games than any video machine, plus draw, program, even do music. I'm more alive than I ever before, and my friends are knocking down my door. Cause now we're into so much more, we're into our Commodore 64. In Hollywood news, Conor McGregor and actual actor Jake Gyllenhaal filmed scenes for the terminally cursed Roadhouse reboot at the UFC 285 weigh-ins. Roadhouse is a movie that's already been rebooted more times than Windows Vista, yet somehow has still never been released. One time set to star fellow MMA acting powerhouse Ronda Rousey. Get out of Earthrealm, Shao Kahn. Oh, what, woman? How about I show you? This iteration of Roadhouse features the star power of the Burger King Lear himself, Conor McGregor. The movie still hasn't seen the light of day, but with advancements in AI and deepfake technology rapidly evolving, there's still a chance to harness the computational power of an entire data center to deepfake his acting skills up to at least fatal deviation level. If you win the tournament, you'll break their power. But what about Nicola? Don't worry, we'll get her back. While doing media for UFC 285, 
Dana White took the opportunity to shut down any talk of Francis Ngannou ever returning to the UFC. Dana smugly seized the opportunity to ram home the fact that he didn't care who Francis was seeing now, it's not like he ever liked him or anything, and that Francis would never again get coupons for Venom gear or be allowed to borrow a pair of The Rock's shoes for a walkout. You said yeah. Skipper is next, is there any chance Francis could be still in, on the mix? No. No. We negotiated with him for years. It's so it's over. Are you, that, are you it's over. That 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 that's over. Yeah. That Me saying his will name never is come back to the UFC. <laughs> no, he'll never be in the UFC. Internet comment sections seized upon this interview as undisputable evidence that Francis now had all the career prospects of Matthew Perry. With no opportunities forthcoming and the UFC moving on without him, the legend of Francis of the fumbled bag was born. The future of Power Slap, the ninja warrior for spousal abusers, was brought into question after it was announced in March that TBS would not be renewing Power Slap for season 2. Dana, never one to be deterred by things like common sense or good taste, announced that he had never even liked TBS anyway, and that he was going to make his own Power Slap TV show with Blackjack and Hookers and film it on Fight Island. To the surprise of literally no one, the Gordon Ramsay of horse meat cuisine, Alistair Overeem, failed a drug test stemming from his 2022 glory kickboxing match with Badr Hari. In Overeem's defence, he couldn't possibly have been on steroids because he had already consumed the entire global supply chain of them. And in great news for all the PFL athletes hoping Jake Paul will be the saviour of their finances, the Bernie Madoff of influencer boxing Jake Paul himself was charged by the SEC for illegally touting a crypto scheme. Surely there must be some mistake. The man who twice scammed fans with bullshit influencer courses and steals copyrighted artworks for his merch would never try and mislead us so. And March ended with UFC 285 and the most hotly anticipated debut since Paige Van Zandt set up an OnlyFans. John Jones finally reached his quota of eyes gouged at light heavyweight and sporting the daddest of bods moved up to heavyweight to face Cyril Gann. Gann, carrying the hopes and dreams of French people like myself, was humped into a living death by Jones before Bruce Buffer's vocal cords had even had a chance to cool down. And in the co-main of it, uh, in the, in the co- UFC 285 went down in history as being the first ever pay-per-view with no co-main event. My life is a living hell. If you look it up, it's just, it's not there. There's, there's no record of it ever happening. As the first of the April showers began, former featherweight goat Jose Aldo took the time out of his busy schedule to chime in on the Nganu situation. Jose explained that Francis had shot himself in the foot by leaving the UFC. He claimed you couldn't just rock up into the world of boxing and expect to get all the incredible perks of the UFC, like being loaned a pair of The Rock's shoes or making a 50k performance of the night bonus. Jose then drove off in a clown car to face Jeremy, who the fuck is that guy, Stevens, in Jorge Masvidal's mid-budget Street Beefs clone. Two of the greatest combat sports moments of the year happened in the same event this April, and it wasn't in the UFC. Hey, bounce up, please. At Fight Circus 6, Rampage Jackson and Bob Sapp took part in a Siamese boxing match. Fight Circus 6 also featured me doing voice work, not to brag or anything, but I'm kind of a big deal in the clown world MMA sphere. Rampage and Sap were strapped into a t-shirt so large, its size required more X's than an Amsterdam red light district. 
Their opponents were none other than the Tony Montana of MMA promoters, John Nutt, and some other guy. However ridiculous that sounds to you, in actuality, it was worse. In the same event, Fight Circus attempted to answer the hypothetical how many five-year-olds could you beat up question when muscle daddy Walter Vale fought two children and it kind of has to be seen to be believed. Welcome. One punch is over. Oh, oh shit. Grab oh, oh. oh my god. Oh. A power oh. bomb by oh. Walter. Oh, no. And he's going to go again. Oh. Tries it. Oh. <laughs> Wait. What is that? Oh. oh. I don't want to go too far out of the limb, but this may have been a bad idea. Oh my god. I didn't think that, that was going to happen. happen. Did oh. I not tell these kids that I will not deal wow. with their shenanigans? Oh Fans of terrible combat sports were eating well in April, as Creator Clash 2 took place, and this image just about sums up the whole farce. And I know a lot of you in the comments are going to give me shit for dunking on an event designed to raise money for charity, but the event didn't even manage to raise the funds it was supposed to, which means I can go ahead and call it the load of self-indulgent shite masquerading as a charity event that it really is. April saw the UFC and WWE's parent companies merged Tetsuo style into one ungodly abomination that can count two of the world's worst human beings as its employees, Dana White and Vince McMahon. The merger also opens the door for all kinds of wacky crossover bullshit that neither fans of wrestling or MMA are interested in. Roman Reigns vs John Jones in a Hell in a Cell match, UFC vs WWE Royal Rumble. D actually, that does sound pretty cool, I I'd probably watch that. Nate Diaz was spotted roaming outside of his natural habitat, the 209. While attending a Misfits boxing event in New Orleans, Diaz did what Diaz does and choked a guy unconscious in the middle of the street for no real reason other than he kind of looked like Logan Paul. If you spot Nate in the wild, do not approach him as he is considered to be exceedingly high and dangerous. If approached by a feral Diaz brother, experts agree your best chance at survival is to distract them by throwing a black shirt and a Deftones CD at them, enabling you to make your escape. More on this late-breaking story as it develops. Power Slap was back in the news this April after a blockbuster event that outsold every UFC pay-per-view ever, with 8 billion pay-per-view sales, meaning literally every human being on Earth tuned in to watch Power Slap. Ah, <laughs> uh, no, I'm just kidding. Six slappers were suspended for a range of doping violations so ridiculously long it reads like the list of side effects in a dick pill commercial. The sheer amount of banned substances coursing through the slappers' veins would make Alistair Overeem blush and prompted Nevada Athletic Commission Chairman Anthony Marnell to say, Is there like a big bowl of performance enhancing drugs down there somewhere that I don't know about? And that's a real, actual quote, I swear to slap Jesus, I am not making that shit up. April also saw Luke Rockhold come out of retirement for a bare-knuckle boxing match. Luke had an almost perfect swan song in the UFC when he just bled all over Paolo Costa's face in one of the most gruesomely beautiful ways to end a career. Rockhold, however, seems determined to squander his god-given handsomeness and signed up for the combat sports equivalent of huffing paint fumes. The fight was waved off midway through round two, after Rockhold got his teeth punched through his face by Florida man Mike Perry. <clears throat> well, fuck. What can I say? You can check bare knuckle off the list. Some crazy shit. Those little knuckles got me. Square on the front, too. Maybe a beard, maybe a better mouthpiece. It's a good fight. It's a shame it ended that way. I'm not done. Conor McGregor had been in attendance that night, and Conor being Conor couldn't handle not being the center of attention. Post fight, he got in the ring of an organization he will never ever fight for, and had the most pointless stare down since that time he faced off against his hotel room TV. And at UFC 287, Jorge Masvidal faced off against Gilbert Burns. 
In one of the careers of all time, Masvidal retired after losing by unanimous decision. Jorge left the UFC to concentrate on his real passions, sucker punching people outside of mid-budget restaurants and struggling to put on a show with higher production values than street beefs. In the main event, Israel Adesanya got revenge over longtime foe Alex Pereira. Izzy reclaimed the middleweight belt in stunning fashion after knocking out Pereira and looked set to rule over the middleweight division for a long time. Foreshadowing is a narrative device in which suggestions or warnings about events to come are dropped or planned. In more bizarro news from the Bush Leagues, in a Kazakh promotion imaginatively titled Octagon, a fighter named Tiago Oliveira attempted to secure a submission via cannibalism. Oliveira was rightly disqualified after chowing down on his opponent's ear like McGregor on a Whopper. UFC 288 landed with a wet thud on the 6th of May. In the main event, King of Cringe Henry Cejudo came out of retirement and immediately returned to retirement after being soundly beaten by Aljamain Sterling in a match I'm pretty sure every one of us has forgotten even happened. 288 was mostly remembered for the featherweight match between Crone Gracie and Charles Jourdain. Gracie employed a technique rarely seen outside of a veterinarian's office when he menacingly butt-scooted around the octagon. Unlike his opponent, fans and fighters alike were happy to dive on Gracie for employing a technique that hasn't been seen in MMA since Bill Clinton was in office. Tony Ferguson's run of misfortune continued when he was arrested for DUI. Ferguson crashed into two cars and flipped his truck outside a Hollywood nightclub, but knowing Tony, crashing into cars and flipping his truck is probably just how he drives normally. In yet more Nganu news, it was announced in May that Francis had signed with the PFL. In a move that initially seemed more confusing than a Baron Bolo, Francis decided to move to an organization where his only big money fight would be against muscle mommy Kayla Harrison. Was this further incontrovertible proof that Francis had fumbled the bag? Unlike with his wife, Dana didn't hold back when discussing Nganu's new business venture. It makes no sense to me. I mean, you're going to pay a guy not to fight for a year, and it's already been like 18 months. He's fought three times in the last three years. It's just not what we do here. It's just... Francis wants to take zero risks. Doesn't want to take any chances. Um, and he obviously didn't want to take a chance against John Jones. And after we saw what happened with Cyril gone, you know, I, I don't blame him. PFL's gonna pay this guy to train for a boxing match that may not even happen and that they might not even be involved in. How, how does that make any sense? It, it, it doesn't make sense to me. I mean, Anthony Joshua called it a gimmick fight this week. It's all about these gimmicky type fights. And that's just not what I do here. It's not what I do. Francis just thinks like, that he's in a position where he's got some Conor McGregor Mayweather fight on his hands, which he does not. He thinks there's, there's all this money in it. I disagree. Foreshadowing is a narrative device. Anticipation for McGregor's return to MMA was high when USADA announced he'd be back in their testing pool any day now. But this is about as close to a pool as Connor would get all year, given the fact that he now looked like Roid Rage Gimli, and his piss was so tainted it needed to be stored in vats underneath Fukushima. Daniel Cormier made headlines when he announced that he was worried that the long-awaited heavyweight matchup between John Jones and Stipe Miocic may not happen. And well, Foreshadowing. there was more bizarro news from the Bush Leagues, this time coming out of Fame MMA in Poland, where fighter Thomas Zedima landed a move known as Schrodinger's Dick Punch, a shot that was a low blow, but also wasn't a low blow. Thomas had aimed at the body, but as the punch was in motion, his opponent attempted a jumping knee, meaning Thomas landed a punch straight into the balls of his opponent while in mid-air and May ended with the premiere of the long-rumoured McGregor vs Chandler series of The Ultimate Fighter. Strap yourself in for eight weeks of fun! 
Summer arrived, and with it, more madness in the minor leagues, this time from Blade Fights 2. But zip your pants back up, because Blade Fights is just a name, and features approximately zero John Wick style knife fights. Instead, what we got was a fighter named Samuel Blasco suffering a ring out, but unlike Soul Calibur, this didn't trigger a game over, as he was allowed to scramble back into the ring where his opponent finished the job much to the sheer screaming delight of this woman. June proved to be a popular month for ring outs. At LFA 160, fighters Josiah Harrell and Mike Roberts managed to eject themselves from the octagon in scenes that hadn't been replicated since the early days of the UFC. Former NFL, UFC and DV star Greg Hardy continued his hot streak of getting knocked the fuck out when he was dropped twice at Team Combat League. At Game 4 of the NBA Finals, it was Denver Nuggets vs Miami Heat, and Conor McGregor vs Common Sense. McGregor scored his first win since the pre-pandemic era, when he knocked out the Miami Heat mascot. What was supposed to be a light-hearted caper ended up with the man in the costume being sent to the emergency room, after Royd Rage Gimli didn't bother pulling his punches and legitimately knocked out a children's entertainer. How do you like them apples? In the most depressing long-running story in MMA, Bigfoot Silva came out of retirement and immediately went back into retirement, after suffering his 11th straight loss. At this point in time, Silva hasn't won a fight since Obama was president, and anyone who books him in their promotion should regard themselves as an enabler and needs to ask themselves some serious fucking questions. UFC 289 arrived in early June, and to celebrate midsummer, the UFC blessed us with a mid-card. Amanda Nunes retired after a career so chock full of battered women it would make Dana White jealous. In the main event, Nunes was scheduled to rematch Juliana Pena to prove once and for all that she had probably been missing car payments and bet on herself to lose in their first fight. Pena was pulled from the fight due to a broken rib, and Nunes' late replacement sacrificial lamb was Irene Aldana. The end result was the kind of fight where you feel like maybe Aldana should consider pressing charges. Tech billionaires and biggest scourges on society since the bubonic plague, Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg looked set to settle their differences in the octagon. Zuckerberg came down with a terminal case of thinking he's a tough guy after doing a couple of private lessons in his penthouse gym and challenged Musk to a cage match. Dana White was hospitalized after wanking himself dry at the prospect of hosting the gimmick match of the century. June ended with an announcement that none of us were ready for. Hicks and Gracie had been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And this one? This one hurt. Hickson is such an important figure in this sport that it would be genuinely difficult to find someone who doesn't love or at very least respect him. Without Hickson, we would never have had Pride FC, as the entire organization was built around his fight with Takada. We would never have had the insanity of Valley Tudo Japan 95, and we definitely wouldn't have had his voiceover work in EA MMA. As the sport moves on, Names like Hickson's tend to fall by the wayside, unknown to newer fans, and consigned to history books few people take the time to read. As Hickson never fought for the UFC, it can be easy to overlook his contribution to MMA for a lot of newer fans, but as long as he's with us, and for even longer after that, Hickson's is a name that deserves to be enshrined in MMA history.
The list of legendary retirements gained another name in July, as former welterweight champion and one half of the bloodiest fight of all time, Robbie Lawler, called it a career at UFC 290. Shockingly for an MMA retirement fight, Robbie not only went out with a win, but with a brutal first round knockout, something almost unheard of in a sport that loves nothing more than feeding the old to its young. Welcome friends to the second annual Just Bleed Award for Bloodiest Fight of the Year. At UFC Vegas 76, Elvis Brenner survived an early onslaught and staged a stunning comeback win. After a vicious elbow opened up Brenner's third eye, so much blood seeped into his silver dye job that he legitimately looked like he was dressing up as Chris Lieben for Halloween in between rounds. Despite being bloodier than a Westerosi wedding, Brenner won via TKO in the third round. Dana, I don't put on gimmick fights, that's not what I do here, White, was determined to make Muskerberg happen and announced in July that he had a date in mind on which to host this totally not a gimmick fight. Dana somehow managed to keep a straight face when he said that watching a fucking dork try and pull guard on a guy whose fighting career has taken place exclusively on Twitter is a billion dollar fight. At UFC 290, Ted Lasso without the mustache, Dricus Duplessis, beat former middleweight champion Robert Whittaker and was immediately thrust into one of the most awkward face-offs of all time with Israel Adesanya. This is my African brother right here. Let's go. What's up? Let's go. What's up? Get don't do. And yeah, no, no, I'm not touching this one. Two ninety was a bad day for fans of aesthetically pleasing violence, as in the main event, Alexander Volkanovsky returned to featherweight and beat the living spinning shit out of Yair Rodriguez. In news that gave me clinical depression, soccer kick enthusiast and Pride FC legend Vanderlei Silva announced that he was entering the clown world of influencer boxing. Silva. A man with decades of fight experience and known for some of the most brutal matches in MMA history, signed up to fight a man whose only fighting experience is battling to find a space on his arse he hasn't already injected into. July saw two UFC pay-per-views, with UFC 291 taking place on the 30th of July. Dana White, the man who absolutely cannot abide even the merest prospect of gimmickry within his hallowed organization, revived a make-believe belt in a symbolic division most famously attributed to a cartoonishly huge Hollywood actor. Justin Gaethje fought Dustin Poirier for the title of Baddest Motherfucker, after former Baddest Motherfucker Jorge Masvidal was stripped of the title for losing three fights in a row and not fucking enough mothers. Gaethje head kick KO'd Poirier and was awarded his cartoon belt and became the undisputed champion of an unreal division. But the biggest news of July happened outside of the fiefdom of Dana White. After months of fumbling, bungling, botching and mishandling the bag, Francis Ngannou announced his next low-risk fight against a lesser opponent would be a professional boxing match against world heavyweight champion Tyson Fury. If Ngannou fumbled this bag, it's only because it was so overloaded with cash that he was having a hard time carrying it. Hate. Let me tell you how much I have come to hate influencer boxing since I began to live. There are 387.44 million miles of blood vessels that fill my body. If the word hate was engraved on each nano angstrom of those hundreds of millions of miles, it would not equal one billionth of the hate I feel for influencer boxing at this micro instant. Hate. Hate for you. 
August began with the gold standard of garbage fights when Jake Paul fought Nate Diaz. After seeing Jake serve a no-knock warrant on the consciousness of Ben Askren and Tyron Woodley, fans were naturally anxious. Should Diaz lose to former Disney kid turned crypto scammer Paul, it would be the capstone in a career spent humiliating retired MMA fighters. Hashtag, who's ready for camp, huh? Diaz fans worldwide clutched their metal militia shirts and waited anxiously to see if Diaz could pull off another UFC 196 and be the one to finally put a beating on the most obnoxious man in combat sports. In typical Diaz fashion, he did his best fighting at the weigh-ins. During the actual fight, Diaz feigned disinterest, attempted a guillotine, and in what is largely predictable Diaz behaviour, after losing a lopsided decision because he spent more time clowning than fighting, he claimed Jake Paul doesn't know how to fight, and if it was in the streets, he'd still be undefeated. With all the misplaced confidence of a stormtrooper at a shooting gallery, UFC prospect and bipedal Zavirax billboard Ian Machado Gary claimed that the entirety of UFC 292 was resting on his shoulders, such was his popularity. After his fight with Jeff Neal was scrapped, a late replacement Neil Magny stepped in. Gary claimed he had saved the card, and was happy that all his fans would get to see him fight. But he was wrong because Ian Gary has no fans. UFC 292 continued the trend for stunning upsets when Sean O'Malley faced Aljamain Sterling in the main event. After wins over top 10 ranked fighters such as Pyotr Jan and, and, uh, and, and, well he has a big following on YouTube so the UFC gave him a title shot. I, like most people, expected Sterling to grind out a hump based win. But O'Malley proved his doubters wrong yet again, when he knocked out Sterling in round two. Dana White broke out his best hand lotion as the prospect of having a champion young enough to use TikTok sank in. Sterling was forgotten faster than a Blumhouse horror movie, and the UFC were in such a rush to promote their new champion as hard and fast as possible that for the first time in their 30 year history, they released the entire main event for free on their YouTube channel the next day. August also saw Dana partake in his favourite pastime of being petty and vindictive. At UFC Vegas 78, Dana attempted to Thanos snap all traces of Francis Ngannou out of existence. Cameroonian native Tafan Nchukwi was introduced as the only Cameroonian fighter in UFC history. This was widely condemned as the bullshit it was, because as we all know, the UFC has had several Cameroonian fighters, Thierry Sokaju, Francis Ngannou, and Mike Perry. Dana was still pressing hard to make Muskerberg happen. White's erection for this fight was harder than McGregor's titanium shin bone, and what better way to stage a totally not gimmick fight than to contact the Italian Minister of Joke Fights to try and stage it in the Roman Colosseum. But but Dana is onto something here. Gimmick fights at UNESCO World Heritage Sites is basically the foundation of Street Fighter 2. Why not make CM Punk vs Mike Jackson 2 at Machu Picchu? Sean O'Malley vs the Nelk Boys at the Pyramids of Giza? These are billion dollar ideas. In MMA, there are only two constants. If Drake bets on you, you will lose. And if you're on the cover of EA UFC, your career henceforth is cursed. And September saw both of these constants put to the test. At UFC 293, middleweight champion Israel Adesanya was set to face Sean Strickland, a man who seemingly blundered his way to a title shot in between hanging truck nuts on his Ford F-150 and getting mad about women having rights on Twitter. Had you or I placed a bet on Izzy to beat Strickland, it would have been as safe a bet as placing half a million on Dennis Seaver not being able to ride the rides at Disneyland. But then Drake had to come along and place a half a million on Izzy to win, and his fate was sealed. 
Izzy put on a jaded, listless performance and allowed Strickland to essentially walk him down and throw some jabs for 25 minutes. Strickland was pronounced the winner, Drake lost a half a million, and the UFC had a middleweight champion with more edge than U2 playing a concert at the Cliffs of Moher. I mean, this man is so edgy. We need to go back to taking women out of the workforce, and maybe that's where we fucked up. Jesus Christ, Shadow. What the hell brought this on? We need to put women back in the kitchen. Only one man needs to be working. So as a collective man group, we need to elect someone that's going to put women back in the kitchen. One man working, raise the wages, and build a fucking wall. Yeah, you basically just said that, but I've still no idea where the hell this is coming from. I want to be a serial killer, but I don't want to go to jail. Okay, even by your standards, this is far too edgy. In other cursed news, September also saw the reveal of the cover art for EA UFC 5. This year's cover stars were allegedly Alexander Volkanovsky and Valentina Shevchenko. For reference, this is Valentina Shevchenko, and this is the main character from a freemium mobile game your four-year-old just accidentally spent $500 on. This is Max Holloway, and this is the main character in an Xbox 360 game that came free with 10 barcodes from Mountain Dew. This is Alexander Volkanovsky, and this... Uh, Actually, they kind of nailed it. This game cost 80 fucking euros for the base game, which, if I'm interpreting this correctly, apparently doesn't even include Valentina or Volk. And if you want those two, I guess you're paying 109 fucking euros for what is essentially a reskinned UFC 4. But hey, EA, I did you a favour and turned your cover art from a laughing stock to a multi-million seller. You're welcome. At Noche UFC, the EA curse made things personal between us, when Valentina fought Alexa Grasso, a woman who mistakenly seems to think she's the flyweight champion of the world. The curse claimed its first victim in 2023, when Judge Mike Bell scored a 10-8 round for Alexa in what was an obvious 10-9. Hate. Let me tell you how much I've come to hate Mike Bell since Noche UFC. I am big is how I stand. Everybody knows that I'm a big man. Don't know defeat because I'm the best one yet. No opponents to fight. It's my only friend. Seattle is my hometown. But Japan Superstar is also fast. This gross miscarriage of justice rendered the fight a split draw, and I guess the UFC felt sorry for Grasso as they let her hold onto Valentina's belt for a while. Fellow EA cover star Volkanovsky was set to rematch Islam Makachev in October, and, well... Foreshadowing as a narrative device. If you think of each month of this year as being individual episodes in a series, then October was the MMA equivalent of Pine Barrens, Ozymandias, or the Battle of the Bastards. This was the kind of month where a year's worth of story and plot development all got dumped into four weeks. Things started off with the moderately big news that McGregor was finally back in the USADA pool. After two years spent ingesting Overeem's personal stash, allegedly, Connor was now subject to USADA testing in preparation for a fight in 2024. Whew, exciting. But Connor's next opponent wouldn't be a fellow UFC fighter, an old man at a bar, or even a woman on his boat. No longer satisfied by beating up individuals, the very same day the announcement of his return was made, Connor fought the entire organization of USADA and won. So desperate were the UFC to get Connor back to active competition that rather than wait for the mandatory six months of testing and minimum of two negative samples, Dana thought a much better arrangement would be if USADA got the fuck out of his organization and Connor did whatever amount of inhuman growth hormones are required to make your face look yoked. 
Reactions from fighters were naturally fucking hilarious, with most assuming that come January and USADA's official departure, it was going to be Pride 2.0. Everyone's favourite drug cheat, John Jones, was among the first to exclaim that he had survived USADA, and now that they were gone, his litany of drug test failures should be stricken from the record. But if I throw my computer out the window, it doesn't erase the fact that I recorded my first videos by talking into the back of a front-facing microphone. The famously level-headed Mark Hunt called Dana a scumbag gutter dog and a worthless fucking mutt. But giving as to how the UFC fed him to a steroid-engorged Brock Lesnar at UFC 200, that's probably an underreaction. The fallout from USADA's departure was seismic with the UFC threatening USADA with legal action over their allegations that the UFC had attempted to nudge nudge wink wink their way into getting Connor an exemption. It's almost like they knew there was no way in hell a man who looks like he's being suffocated by his own suits would pass a piss test. Welcome friends to the Blowy Award for Fight of the Year 2023. 2023 was a stellar year for fisting activities, with shocking upsets and bloody battles, but no one man managed to beat an entire organisation into a living death, quite like Connor vs USADA. McGregor ended USADA's reign of tyranny over his bladder, and with one toxic blast of urine, an entire company was defeated. Fighters in every division are now free to wallow in more juice than the man from Del Monte's toilet bowl. And we owe it all to Connor. Connor, for your role in helping turn the UFC into a steroid blasting free for all, your fight with USADA is our fight of the year. How do you like them apples? Post Connor v USADA madness, UFC 294 had a tough time on its hands making any headlines, but with multiple last minute opponent changes and a card that was filled with wall to wall weirdness, 294 was one of the most memorable cards of the year. The insanity began in the prelims, when Victor Henry was the recipient of the worst low blow of the year. Oh shit, another ward already? Okay, hang on. <coughs> Welcome, friends, to the Keith Hackney Award for Most Egregious Low Blow. At UFC 295, Victor Henry zigged when he should have zagged, and caught a thigh kick where there was no thigh. His opponent, Javid Basharat, appeared to be trying to ensure that this is where the Henry bloodline ends, and planted his foot squarely in the knackers. But while there were wilder dick shots such as Schrodinger's dick punch at Fame MMA, what makes Henry special was how the ringside doctor tried to gaslight Henry, despite the roiling sickness in his gut and pain radiating from his balls like the icy winds of a Norse hell. He in fact hadn't been kicked in the balls. What's in the balls? What's in my balls? No, it wasn't your ball. You didn't kick your balls. Oh no, oh, oh, come my, on, man. All dick and balls. Okay. My dick and now the emotion. doctor's gonna okay. tell him that it dick didn't hit his there. testicles? Come on, man! Henry. It was all dick and balls, and this award is all yours. Referee cockups weren't confined to the prelims though, as on the main card, Johnny Walker ate an illegal knee by Magomed and Kalaev. Despite Walker seemingly being okay to continue, the ringside doctor felt that Walker's inability to solve a basic algebra equation recited in ancient Sumerian was enough to wave the fight off. To add to the weirdness of 294, Mike Breeden proved he has that dog in him. When down two rounds to zero, he began barking at his opponent. He can't do it in spurts, because Jubilee won the first two rounds. Oh, no. oh. Proving that bestial imitation is the best base for MMA, Breeden won via KO in the third round. Initially, 294 was to be headlined by a rematch between Charles Oliveira and Islam Makachev, but Oliveira pulled out due to injury. On two weeks' notice, Alexander Volkanovsky stepped up to take his place, presumably after stepping on a box first. In the co-main, Hamzat Chemaev was set to face Paolo Costa, but Costa was pulled from the fight suffering from a staph infection. Former welterweight GOAT Kamaru Usman stepped in on short notice, 
and suddenly 294 was a far better card than it had been in its original iteration. The Hamzat hype train was, if not derailed, then at least slightly delayed, when he gassed out after one round and only managed to scrape a decision over a man who was both making his middleweight debut and stepping in on less than two weeks notice. In the main event, Islam scored a brutal head kick knockout, but head kicks are slightly less impressive when your opponent has to stand on his tiptoes to look you square in the navel. October was a big month for clown world boxing. Under normal circumstances, a KSI boxing match would be further off my radar than a fucking stealth bomber. But KSI vs Tommy Fury was notable for the fact that it was a card so genuinely abysmal that it may finally be the death knell for clown world boxing. Yeah, look, so I says to him, I says, if you don't find the Cleave Solace before the next Blood Moon, it's not going to be my balls they sacrifice to Krom Krug. Oh, hang on, shit, I'll call you back. Welcome, friends, to the Krusty the Clown Award for Worst Influencer Boxing Match. The co-main event of Fury vs KSI was a fight so truly detestable that it very well may herald the end times of influencer boxing. Dylan Dennis fought Logan Paul, but whether you can actually call anything he did fighting is still up for debate. Dennis landed less significant strikes than Dana White did on his wife slapping world tour, with a grand total of 9 punches for the entire fight. Staring down the prospect of a humiliating loss after all of his shit talking, Dennis said, you can't fire me, I quit, and got himself disqualified by attempting a guillotine, a takedown, and inciting a mass brawl. Embarrassingly for Danis, his takedown was about as effective as his striking, and his guillotine was about as effective as his takedown. And Logan, don't think you're getting off that easily either, as despite windmilling harder than a Dutch landscape, you were barely able to put a dent in a man Ben Askren could probably banish to the land of wind and ghosts. Dylan, your MMA career was a blight on the sport, but if nothing else, we're grateful that blight has spread and put the cracks in the foundation of influencer boxing. And before we get into the real meat of October, I'd just like to very briefly bring up the sheer insanity that is Mike Jackson versus Pat Miletic. Mike, the CM Punk killer Jackson, fought 57-year-old Hall of Famer Miletic. The fight was a grudge match, after Jackson wrote an article highlighting Miletic's involvement in the January 6th riots in DC. Miletic subsequently lost his job as a colour commentator for LFA, and the two settled it in the cage of an Iowan bum league. Although settled is a strong term for Jackson getting wrestle humped for two rounds, before the 57 year old Miletic quit on his stool in the second round. The real news of October was at Ganu vs Fury. For years now, we've endured the sight of MMA fighters so far past their prime they'd need a Mariner's Astrolab to find it, getting ethered by Jake Paul. The narrative that MMA fighters simply can't transition to boxing was one that was starting to take hold. But within Ganu vs Fury, that question would be put to bed once and for all. Here we had Nganu, still in his prime, versus the best heavyweight boxer of his generation. If Nganu's outing was as ill-fated as those of Askren, Woodley or Nate, then maybe Jake Paul is right, and MMA fighters just suck at striking. After months of speculation, and a not inconsiderable amount of ridicule from fans and pundits, Nganu finally faced Fury on the 28th of October. In one of the biggest illegal streams of the year, Nganu didn't just do well for an MMA fighter, he stood toe to toe with the heavyweight boxing champion, scored a knockdown, and took rounds from him. In terms of MMA to boxing crossovers, despite the fact that he ultimately lost a decision, Nganu's was the most successful by a vast margin. Francis just thinks like, that he's in a position where he's got some Conor McGregor Mayweather fight on his hands, which he does not where he could fight lesser opponents and, and make more money. Francis wants to take zero risks. Doesn't want to take any chances. Um, PFL's going to pay this guy to train for a boxing match that may not even happen and that they might not even be involved in. How, how does that make any sense? Immediately post-fight, Jake Paul called out Nganu for a match. 
<laughs> no, I'm just kidding. We all know Jake only fights people old enough to have owned an Atari 2600. The fun is back! Oh yes, siree! It's the 2600 from Atari! It's the video system with classics galore! From space invaders to cars that roar! A real hip joystick controls the screen! Solaris is hot and Midnight Magic's mean! And one more thing, it's got a special low price! Under 50 bucks! 50 bucks? Now isn't that nice? The fun <laughs> is back! Oh yes, siree! It's the 2600 from Atari! November began with the news that two wrongs can make a slightly bigger wrong, when the PFL bought Bellator and merged into the corporate entity known as PFLator. PFLator opened up all kinds of exciting avenues for PFL stars to find Bellator stars, such as Jake Paul vs. Ryan Bader, Jake Paul vs. Kayla Harrison, Jake Paul vs. Tito Ortiz, and Jake Paul vs. Kent Shamrock, the man who puts the mid in middleweight the Shadow the Hedgehog of MMA, edgier than Marilyn Manson streaming hatred, Sean Strickland was back in the news for suitably edgy reasons. So edgy. Strickland decided to voice his incredibly edgy opinion about women in MMA. Female MMA. It's like watching children fight. It's fun. But we all know it's trash. They only have a job because they know when to put heels on and take off their clothes. Jesus Christ, Shadow, what the fuck? Maybe I do belong in the kitchen. Strickland shat forth nuggets of wisdom, such as female fighters only exist because men want to fuck them, and seven times UFC champion Valentina Shevchenko looks like she learned to strike by watching YouTube videos and only has a job because she knows when to put heels on and take her clothes off. But Sean is probably bright, because who else would have such a vast knowledge of terrible fights than a man who spent the first eight years of his career without making it out of the prelims and fight night cards? At UFC Vegas 82, another woman who totally sucks and should realistically be making me a grilled cheese right now, Amanda Hebus, scored a devastating knockout via spinning wheel kick to the face. And that's 100% more spinning wheel kick knockouts than Deshaun Decision Strickland has on his resume, so maybe he could ask her for some pointers. November. What else happened in November? Not much if I'm being honest, and really, November was like two weeks ago. Do you really need me to recap what happened in easily recallable memory? If you need me to tell you what happened two weeks ago, then I'm afraid you have problems this video cannot resolve. So that's it. This video is already three times longer than last year's end of year video. Then what more do you want from me? Just, yep, yeah, I'm done. Just play the fucking song. Now, <laughs> now you're turning into the beast. That's right, channel 81 on your FM dial. And I want you just to take your hand and turn the volume real, real loud. I don't want to have to beat you up. One, two, three. You The beginning. Superstar is also found. Don't worry, cause you will see. I traded places with him. Now Japan has me. <laughs> In our team. <laughs> well, thank Christ that's over. Shadow, what did you think of this year's video? It was lame and gay. Too many goddamn women. 
Uh, assuming he's into women, wouldn't that make it not gay? Women are gay, unless they're bringing me a snack while I play Xbox. Then they're the good kind of porny gay. Shadow, you have to be the most zero bitches getting motherfucked.